Why people hate TDD. Dave, take it away. Test-driven development is one of those things that you seem to either love or hate. Actually, that's not really been my experience. I'm a TDD lover, I suppose, if you can love at all. I certainly value it highly. My experience has rather been that the majority... Okay, so I feel like one and a half is a little fast for Dave. Okay, let's go... What? Let's go... <laughs> Let's start off at 1.25. Let's try this again. Okay, we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna try this again. Here we go. <laughs> Why people hate TDD? Test driven development is one of those things that you seem to either love or hate. Actually, that's not really been my experience. I'm a TDD lover, I suppose, if you can love at all. I certainly value it highly. Did I just hear? I'm not trying to make any snap judgments about Dave, but did he just say the saddest thing in the universe? I'm a TDD lover, I suppose, if you can love at all. I certainly if you can love at all. Uh, okay. What is love, baby? Don't hurt me. You value it highly. My experience has rather <laughs> been that the majority of people really like test driven developments once they've seen it working. But getting people to try it is often very difficult indeed. There are lots of people, though, that do profess to hate it and are very I so so just so you know, I am somebody that hates TDD. Do you get like type one in the chat if you love TDD, type two in the chat if you hate TDD, and then I'm sure you guys will also fill it with various other numbers describing that you don't really care. I'm 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 in the hater camp. Did, wait, hold, I've actually forgot. Did I say two for hate or love? Because I see a lot of twos, and now I'm starting to think you guys love TDD. That can't be real. That can't be real. Did I forget two equals hate? Okay, <laughs> like. Damn, I misjudged my audience a lot. I guess I'm a loner on this? Why? Yeah, two's for hate. Okay, I just thought maybe, I, I thought maybe I had a really odd opinion here for a second, okay? Um, let's, so, so instead of me giving my judgment, let's do what I think is a better move to do in general. Let's hear a good argument for why we should enjoy TDD, and then let's take that argument, and can we apply our opinion still, or, or have they defeated us, right? Let's try to be when I and others recommend it. I think that they're wrong in this and missing something that would okay. improve their skills significantly if they adopted it. But me saying things like that is the sort of thing that annoys them. And I can kind of understand that too. Someone like me just repeating, you aren't doing it right if it doesn't work. Is By the way, if, if your answer is you aren't doing it right and that's why it doesn't work, I mean, that means TDD falls under, I mean, the, it falls under Scotsman, communism, now TDD. Like, it's just, you, you don't want to be in that category. You don't want to be uh, agile development. You don't want to be in the category of, of you're just not doing it right. Really good enough. So can we tackle this for a different angle? Okay. Let's take a look at some of the common objections to test-driven development and address them without only me saying you're doing it wrong, or at least try to. Woo! I gotta get Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery. Welcome to my channel. If you haven't been here before, please do hit subscribe. And if you enjoy the content today, hit like as well. Let's start with the definition so that we're sure that we're all talking about the same thing. Love it. Because right. one of the ways that people do TDD wrong is not to do it at all. Okay. Test from development is about driving the code from tests. So red, green, refactor. Red, write a test, see it fail. This tests the test and makes us focus on what we want the code to do. Green, make the test pass. This finds the shortest route to stability in the form of code with a passing test. And refactor, tidy the code and test to make them beautiful, elegant, simpler, and more generic, whatever it is that we want of the code. So, so one thing I immediately dislike about this is that I find that, so maybe I define the word unit incorrectly. Maybe I define it not the way they do. But for me, a unit is always comes down to just simply a function. I'm really testing a function and in and out a black box. That's what I consider a uh, like a um, a uh, unit testing or yeah, unit testing. Sorry, I don't know why I got so mixed up there. Black box testing, single function testing. To me, that is unit testing in of itself. I want that you you want that shirt. Yeah. And so when I see this red to green, I get that. I totally get this. It's actually the blue part that is really why I get most confused here. Do you know what I mean? Because it's the blue part that causes it to be so difficult. It's because when I go from red, creating a test that, doesn't cre uh, that hasn't been created, to green and enjoying it, often 
when I refactor, it requires a wide range of changes, right? Like I want to change how things are done maybe in its completeness. And so at an integration test level or an end-to-end -end test level, though that interface may not change, but everything inside of it is going to change. And so whenever I do this blue part, I always feel like I become red, not because I am, uh, not because I am somehow, you know, like failing or creating bad code. It's because the shape that it was in is no longer even there anymore. And now the functions that I was testing, the black box that I was testing is completely different. And so then I end up rewriting tests to reflect the reality, which almost in some sense, I actually write tests to give me green, which ultimately gives me kind of like the big warning signs, right? Which means that I'm now writing potentially synthetic tests that don't actually test anything, but I've simply become something naughty, right? I've actually become something wrong. Yes, I don't know what code I want uh, until I start writing code. Then I go through a few iterations. Yeah, exactly. So this is this is like, this right here is my argument against TDD in a nutshell, which is I do use tests to drive development sometimes because I just need something that I can quickly test, right? If you have a program that requires you to go get data from a database and then it has to come back and you have to go get it from another source and maybe that source is like some sort of big data source so it takes like seven seconds. No, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna create synthesized or a synthetic data version of that just so I can test really, really fast and make sure I have all the right state, right? It's just a little different. So can we all agree that if you don't write the test first, it really isn't test driven development. We can agree with that, right? Can everyone agree with that? If you don't write the test first, it is not test driven development, which I think he's 100% correct on. I think we're both now perfectly on the same page because or else you're not letting the test drive the development. Instead, you're driving the development and then coming back and doing something different. Anything else is just testing. And that's something quite different with different goals and a different set. So let's see, hold on. Someone's saying fix some audio. Let's see, uh, am I just peaking on this system? Thus I'm getting Speaking on this here, let me, yeah, I had this thing all the way up. So I'll try doing this. Here we go. Sorry, my bad. My B. The problems. TDD allows us to bypass most of the problems with testing alone, but they aren't the same thing at all. This is such a common confusion that as a promoter of test driven development, it's my impression that confusing test driven development with just testing leads us wrongly to ascribe the failure and problems of just testing to test driven development. I'd like to say I'm a genius. Uh, so here's the problem is that sometimes we listen to, uh, to, to videos and their volume, people normalize videos to like absolutely just, just savage levels of lowness, right? Where it's like they're whispering in. And so I'm jacking my audio levels all the way to the tippity top just to hear anything. So I guess that you could say that now I'm just saying you're doing it wrong again. But I'd say that in this case, it's more like you aren't doing it at all. So that seems fair to me. Okay, fair. We're on the I same I talk team. about this confusion and more in this video. So do check that out after we've finished with this one. Let me pause there to say thank you to our sponsors. We're fortunate to be sponsored by Equal Experts, Tricentis, Transfic, and Ice Panel. All these companies offer products and services that are well aligned with the topics that we discuss on this channel every week. So if you're looking for excellence in continuous delivery and software engineering, click on the links in the description below to check them out. The other thing that I'd like to put on the table to remove uh, as a distraction from this discussion is that test-driven development is a skill. It's not innate to anyone. Everyone who wants to do it needs to learn how. Did we just get to skill issue? Are we about to, is, are we about to hit a skill issue? I feel like I just got hit with a skill issue. And it takes a little time and practice to get good at it. Not, if not a long time, but some time. Even very good programmers aren't good at test-driven development straight away. That's a problem for test-driven development adoption because if you try it for a short time, or if you're only trying it because your teammate or your boss told you to, you probably won't get to the good stuff or you won't be paying close enough attention when you do. I suppose this is me saying you're doing it wrong yet again. And I think that this is probably the real source of this criticism of people like me who try to promote the idea. But I think that these two things are simply facts. If you try to play before he does his analogy, actually, we'll let him do his analogy, and then I'm gonna get, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna render judgment onto him. Tennis or pool or League of Legends for two hours, you won't be any good at it, and you probably won't understand what the appeal is. If you play table tennis instead of tennis and then dismiss tennis, you're not making a fair or reasonable comparison. So let's look at some of the common. Okay, 
I, I understand his point. You know, like, you know, I, I've used a lot of Rust. I've written a lot, a lot of Rust. Um, I, I, I would put myself as fairly good at it. I'm not great. I don't know all the nooks and crannies of Rust. I don't pretend to know even the entire standard. I, I don't pretend to do, uh, you know, like I'm somehow great at these things. Uh, but ultimately, what I see that is a huge downfall of Rust is that it's hard, right? It's just simply a hard language, and it has some... It has some use cases that are really great for Rust, right? That just do a really good job fitting the language. And then there's some use cases where it's like you're just shoehorning it in and it feels really annoying, but we still do it anyways because Rust is really fantastic. And so I totally get this argument where you're just saying, well, hey, it's because you haven't done it enough. Therefore, you don't understand it. This is effectively his argument. He even agreed that his argument is that you're just doing it wrong. The hard part about doing that is that this isn't just me with a specific language on a specific problem. This is saying an entire way to write software overall is that there's some level that you have to achieve, some unknown state where it actually becomes better. But you don't really have like a strong way to prove that it's actually any better. That's kind of what I'm seeing right now is that this is how I like to write software. Therefore, it's the correct way to write software. Now, I take a much different approach. A little bit looser, maybe a little goosier. I, I get it. Objections that are more clearly about test driven development itself. First, people often say that test driven development is too slow. I think there's a real grain of truth here. At the time when you are writing the tests and the code, it is slower, certainly when you're just starting out. There are several reasons for this, though. One is that TDD forces you to change how you think about solving problems, and that's challenging, and particularly. I mean, this is literally, this is literally a Rust argument right now. I mean, he is word for word making the Rust argument. Here we go. If you are an experienced but non-TDE dev, this definitely feels slow and painful. Everything is familiar, but different enough to trip us up. So we are in fact going slower. I think as a result, it's usually easier to teach test-driven development to less experienced people. They have fewer bad habits to unlearn, I suppose. <laughs> I'm a reasonably experienced record. <laughs> argument like 101 tdd equals rust oh no skier i've skied quite a lot since i was a boy one of my then teenage sons wanted to learn to snowboard he was already a good skier so i thought that i'd give it a try too my son had had lessons and so we rented a board for me to go snowboarding with him as well and he showed me some of the basics i skied to a gentle slope sat down on the snow and switched to the board while i sat there looking at my feet Someone sneakily tilted the mountain up and made it dramatically steeper and more dangerous while I wasn't looking. The results were what you might expect, and I returned gratefully to my skis after the usual kinds of things that you would imagine happening, uh, and the mountain regained its normal gentle slope again. I think that this is the same effect as the experienced developers trying test-driven development. Oh my the difference... I just got like a hair or, or like a bug right in my eyeball. I'm not sure what just happened there, but I just went from normal mode to like really painful in a matter of seconds. Okay, we're back in. Though, is that test-driven development offers real concrete benefits, where as whether or not I chose to ski or snowboard is really just about me having fun. So right now, I'm still on board where everything that has been described described up until this point is purely. It's kind of like, this is pretty much the classic DX argument, which is, does it feel better for you? Then it's better developer experience. TDD feels better for me because I can do it really well. Therefore, it's good for me. Therefore, it's good. It's good developer experience. You like good developer experience, don't you? You should do TDD, right? It becomes like this, this like kind of like circle of argument, right? Where you can't technically defeat it at any point because the initial, the initial point is subjective and it just overlaps on top of itself. So then it's just, it's, it's unarguable. So I think that there should be a bit more of a professional skills focus when learning test-driven development. I may be hardline in this, but I think that test-driven development is always better than not. And so learning it is a kind of professional duty of care issue. The other more obviously commercial advantage here is that unlike the snowboarding, where when it feels strange and difficult, progress really is slow, in test-driven development, that is more of an illusion. Generally, whenever I see someone say that there's like a professional requirement to be an engineer, like they're the same people that want uh, certifications usually, uh, I, I find all those things to be completely irrelevant.
because the certification almost exclusively goes away within moments, right? Within within just a couple years, anything that you're certified on becomes irrelevant. Like the amount of Java certifications that were largely available not too long ago are all almost completely not available uh, just because it doesn't, they don't mean anything. So I'm, I, I am still having a little bit of a hard time here following some of this. Test-driven development is like an investment of thinking. The big savings come later, after the investment has been made. So it's a bit more work at the time when you are actually doing the investing. At the point of writing the test, it feels slower to me too than just writing the code. But it isn't because without the test to guide us, we're more likely to make mistakes in the code that slow us down and then spend more time figuring out our mistakes and fixing them, which slows us down more. Probably filling up, fiddling around testing the code manually, which is way slower than simply rerunning a test. So there, there's definitely an inherent missing point or an inherent argument here, which is incorrect. Uh, I believe this is like a very concrete way of me arguing against this, which is you are making the assumption that you can test bug free, but you cannot write code bug free. I've written bugs in my tests such that I've confirmed bad behavior. I have written good tests that have confirmed bad behavior, <laughs> right? Like that's the problem is that you can't think like the reason why I write buggy code is because I can't think of every way the code may fail. And if the code may fail in an unexpected way, I never wrote the test to begin with. Therefore, it still fails the unexpected way in the end. Something about this is kind of like a cop-out to actually, hey, no matter what, you aren't good enough. That's just that. We're also more likely to release buggier code into production. One, one more thing I do want to state that if you don't have a lot of pre-written code already that you're testing, often I also find it much harder to write declarative tests. Uh, I try to always write my tests as declarative as possible because I don't really want to have any like explicit stated like for loops. I really do try to avoid any for loops because that almost exclusively, you know, every time I add more logic into a test, I've just written something that's harder to maintain and harder to know when I've done something wrong or right. And so... When I have nothing, it's really hard to write something that's declarative, right? Because then you're right, you're going to have to write some set of code to be able to produce all these things in kind of a declarative way. But then how do you know that that's correct? Now you kind of get this whole chicken and an egg thing going on. Logic and test. I, I mean, the problem is, is that if you've written enough unit tests, there always comes a point where you're going to have to write some set of logic at some point. I know it's terrible, but you just have to. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> We're good. I know. Then uh, do, I've literally written a test for a test once. It that's how I knew I've hit the end. The end game is when you write a test for your test. You literally test driven development your framework for test driven development to your software. I did this once. Okay, I was a TDD guy at one point. And so we'll end up spending lots of more time figuring out and, and fixing bugs from there too. The state of DevOps reports say that teams that score well on stability and throughput spend forty four percent more of their time on new features. Stability and throughput. Notice that none of that technically supported TDD or did not support TDD, right? That's just simply saying stability. And almost always when it comes to DevOps, stability is like platform uptime or reliability of integration slash end-to-end -end tests. But don't directly measure test-driven development though. But they do measure continuous integration and continuous delivery and software quality. There's at least I'm going to give one hot take at the end of this about ETE slash integration tests. At least a correlation between good scores in continuous inter integration and continuous delivery and test-driven development. So while it may seem slower, actually the teams that practice TDD are usually a lot faster, at least in my experience, and uh, that, that at least correlates with the more scientific research from the state of DevOps reports. Next, pushback. Test-driven development doesn't work. Oh, I'm sorry, but that's a just a dumb thing to say. It may not work for you, but it does work. And it's used to build some of the best software systems in the world. Tesla practiced test-driven development for cars. NASA used test-driven development for early space rockets. SpaceX practices test-driven development for modern space rockets. Siemens Healthcare practiced test-driven development for medical systems. Siemens. <laughs> I worked on a team that built one of the highest performance financial exchanges in the world. And we used TDD every day, all day, for at least five, the five years that I was there. And I'm pretty sure that they still do too many years later. 
sorry, but saying that this doesn't work is simply an expression of ignorance. What I do, I do generally agree with that. Saying something doesn't work is flat out saying, oh, this won't work because it's no good. I mean, it's the same people that dog on HTMX while they're building their recipe website, right? It's just like, oh, really? It doesn't, it doesn't work for your recipe website? Okay, I, I get it. You're right. How could you ever have that interactivity of a thumbs up? Yeah, well, what about offline? Yeah, you're right. Those classic websites that we all use offline, such as YouTube that I use offline all the time, or Twitter, uh, or Twitch. I use Twitch offline regularly. You know all those websites? People that claim that it doesn't work are really saying is, I don't know how to do this. So the answer to that is for them to learn how. If they want Fair. to drop it once they know how, they're crazy, but fine, that's their choice. So that's ad hominem. So remember, that's ad hominem. So Dave, that was that was a poor argument. I, I do expect more from Dave than that. Um, I do agree, though, that the doesn't work approach almost exclusively comes almost. There are times where it just simply doesn't work. Like uh, TDD doesn't work. That's just actually a good a good statement. I don't think it works that great. I think ultimately in the end, you create software that's significantly harder to refactor. Uh, but I have reasons why I think it doesn't work. Just saying something doesn't work. True. Agree. You're the same team as you. That's not a good argument. Almost always born out but of But saying guys. that it doesn't work is just plain wrong. If you'd like to try test driven development for yourself, I have an introductory free tutorial that you can try. There's a link in the description to this video and in the comments, so do check those out. Next on the pushbacks. Test driven development can't work for infrastructure, embedded systems, games, legacy systems, my complicated code, and so on. Well, yes it can. Once again, what this sounds like to my ears is, I don't know how to do it which is fine, so learn how. But it can and does work in all of these cases. And this, this little little ticker right here that keeps on saying the same four things over and over again, driving me uh, crazy. Many, many more. The fundamental ideas of test-driven development are actually pretty simple and completely generic. It may be more difficult for some kinds of code and for some technologies than others, but it works everywhere. If you're tech... See, one of the problems with like doing this, like, you know, exactly what he's saying. Some of the problems that he's suggesting is that you can do it everywhere and you should do it everywhere, but you end up building a bunch of just like off, off band logic, which is always just terrible. Like embedded systems, you're going to have to mock out the embedded nature of things. You're going to have to write pr programs in such a way that you can mock things out. And C isn't necessarily the most fun language to just write a bunch of mocks for and unit tests for as it is, let alone let alone being able to do it for all of hardware and be able to create these synthesized tests because in the end, hardware versus your synthetic tests don't always line up one for one. That means you have to actually replicate an environment that is almost one for one or perfectly one for one and would be the ideal goal as say your embedded project, which can be extremely hard to do. Extremely hard to do. And so I, I just don't necessarily buy that as a uh, thing one should do. Technology or language doesn't support unit testing it may be worth looking harder because it probably does if you if, if you search around enough. But if really not, then writing a version of XUnit to allow you to do it is really pretty easy. I've done it several times myself in the past. I've worked with test driven development with teams building FPGA based systems, um, games uh, and infrastructure as code. Fundamentally, you need to be able to decide what you'd like your software to do and write that down in code. That's your test. One of the good things and maybe more challenging things for people new to test driven development is that it forces us to pause and consider a bit more carefully what we'd really like our code to do before we actually write the code. It's a very common mistake for developers to say things like, how can I know what to test before I've got the, written the code? But you're not testing how the code does things. You're testing what the code is meant to do. And if you don't know what you want it to do, then you probably aren't ready to write that code yet anyway. Writing a test that's... So how do you become ready then? Like real talk, how, when, at what point do you become ready? Let's just say you have a data source you don't really know, plus you have an output and you want to produce, like say a CSV from this data source at some point. How do you know you're ready to start writing code? Like at some point, somewhere, you might have to write code just to figure out what is actually the things that are happening. So would that be test-driven development or is that spike-driven development at that point? 
says clearly in, in the form of an executable specification, what we want our code to do is a big part of the value of the whole approach and is the reason why many test driven developers talk about TDD being more about design and less about testing. If you can't express that goal for your code clearly, I really don't think that you understand the problem you're working on yet. Or I agree with that. Uh, and I think most problems you don't understand thoroughly anyways to begin with. In fact, most problems I find that you even think you understand them and when you fully understand it and you do end up writing all these tests out and you get everything perfectly running and you have the most glorious unit test system ever, you realize you've already been fundamentally wrong long beforehand and now you have to throw away everything because you're actually incorrect from the get-go and you just simply didn't know because there's no way for you to know until you got to a certain point within the software development cycle. This has happened more than once to me just because things change. Have you ever picked the wrong system? Because that was the system that was most likely to be the right one. Like one time I was doing a real-time monitoring of, uh, of, of stats and, I, and then I also wanted stats from like a, a cold storage version. And guess what? Both of those became deprecated and a completely different source came up with completely different looks and completely different features and completely different everything, which made me have to rewrite the entire pipeline. Right? Like there's no way I could have predicted that. And so it means every single test I wrote, I had to throw away. You know how painful that is? It's really painful when you have hundreds of tests that you have to completely throw away because ultimately in the end, you built it for a moving target and the moving target moved. It's like Sisyphus. You're just pushing stuff up, up a hill. At least don't have a very clear view of where your design is heading. And writing the test before you write the real code is a great way to explore both of these ideas. So whatever you do next, write a test or not, you're not going to do as good a job of the code if you don't have this perspective. And TDD forces you to think more carefully from that perspective. This is also one of the stumbling blocks though, because test driven development does force you to do this. And some programmers aren't used to thinking quite so clearly about what they'd like the code to do. This is the real challenge of TDD, I think. It brings design front and center into the, pro the process of software development. And it highlights the shortcomings of design more quickly and more clearly than anything else that I know of. So me personally, I've never really had much of a clarity in design of code at the unit test level. You know what I mean? I almost always have clarity at the end-to-end -end level, right? When you create an interface for, a, say, part of your data fetching and all this, and then you create an interface for part of your data munging and all that, and then you create part of your interface for interacting with the CLI arguments and all that, and then you put everything together, and you realize, oh, I really didn't like how I shifted this thing here. Oh, I really didn't like this. It almost always comes from the integration points that I realized where my problems were and some things that were a little bit harder. Like, right, you could write the world's greatest way to produce widgets. But if the widgets and how they're produced is really poor for how you get your data, it doesn't matter how great this part is. You now have to abstract it or do something to it that makes it really, really hard. I'm still going to give my whole opinion at the end about integration, end-to-end, uh, -end and unit tests. This is a challenge because software yet. design is a difficult skill to learn and to be good at. I'm not saying here that you can't do good design without test-driven development. If you are skilled enough, then you can. But what test-driven development does is to help people, whatever their level of skill at design, to more clearly see the consequences of their design choices. It gives them fast feedback on design so that they can learn faster. This is a very good thing indeed, and it helps you to get better at designs more quickly and more easily. This also means that as someone recently said in a Twitter conversation, I can explain to you how and why I make the design choices that I make because I'm guided by test driven development. Can you do that without test driven development? Yes. TDD provides design guide rails that are otherwise- It's actually the exact same reason why TDD allows you. You're able to take software, see how it should be built, and then from seeing how it should be built, you built an interface in your head, and then you wrote it down in TDD and just did it first. Maybe you put it in a document first. Maybe you made some sequence diagrams first. Hell, maybe you even went with some UML class diagrams. Hated your life a little bit, but nonetheless, you brewed that black coffee in the morning. Got pumped up, made some class diagrams, maybe some abstract classes. You shut your mouth with that email, boy! <laughs> I was missing completely, other than through experience or expertise. And that is generic. If test room development seems like a poor fit, it's telling you something about the design of your system. 
changing the design so that TDD is easier is always a positive step in the quality of the design as far as I've seen. So again, a very, very subjective statement. Designing your code to always work with TDD makes better co code in my experience. You know, again, this is a very, a very subjective state. You can't really, again, this just mostly proves the classic DX argument, which is if it feels better, it's better DX, right? That's it. That's what everyone's saying. That's what everybody says. If it feels better, it's better DX. Why? Well, it feels better. It feels better. Therefore, it is better. Is it? It is. Because it felt Next better. Next on my list of pushbacks. I know what I do, and it works. Well, statistically, you don't, and it doesn't. There was a... Uh, I actually strongly agree with this guy. I strongly agree with that. Completely. You don't know what you're doing. And no, it doesn't work. And that's why I'm also super hesitant about your TDD. Study of how production systems fail. It found lots of interesting things. Uh, what do you suppose the most common line of code says at the point when a production system fails? It's usually a comment saying something like, to do, must implement exception handling here. So you're telling me there could also be a test that says to do. Enable this test and fix the bug. 92% of the catastrophic system failures are the result of incorrect handling of non-fatal errors explicitly signaled in the software. Boom, Rust argument or Go argument. Really, when you think about it, that's a Go argument too. 74% of failures are deterministic. They are guaranteed to manifest with appropriate inputs. Most of the errors that cause production outages like this are caused by the kinds of mistakes. Really? 70, only 74% can be caused? Are people's programs that? Like, that actually shocks me. I think that that last one, we should take a pause there and say 26% of known bugs are just crazy-ass race conditions. Is that what I'm hearing? What? That's it. That to me, that's to me, that's like the bigger one we should be focusing on, which is how did you get to that point that you're getting Heisenbugs 26% of the time? Mistakes that we all make commonly rust. in code. Mistakes that will be caught and so eliminated entirely by simple testing of some kind. At Classic. 58% of code. At this stage, I often get pushback on, yes, but you can't test everything. There are complex interactions. And yes, that's true. But remember, 74% were not complex interactions. They were completely deterministic. Of the 26% remaining, less than half of those, depending on bugs caused by timing. And that was timing only through the inputs. So about 12% of mistakes are of this more complex variety. So why not fix all of the easy things first and get an 88% reduction in production defects? Isn't that like the same percentage Rust also claims they're going to solve? So just use Rust. That's what I'm hearing right now. Just use Rust. You're probably not good at enough skill issue. Just use it. You'll get better. Trust me. It actually gets better. Quick maths. Before worrying too much about the more complicated edge cases. Actually, it's been my experience that once you do adopt test-driven development and its mindset, then this final 12% of bugs is more tractable too. Because test-driven development encourages very strongly to design more deterministic systems. Because systems like these are easier to test. Can we disable the test just for this release? <laughs> I shudder when I hear this kind of thing. Not just because I advocate test room development, because it seems to me also that to express a deep misunderstanding, not only of, about testing, but also what software development in general is really all about. Yeah, you don't disable a test. Like everybody knows that you don't disable a test. You delete a test, right? That's the truest way. Delete the test. It goes green. You've done it. Release away. Release away. Like, we all know that. That's exactly how you do it. That's always been the way. If you have people saying this, you have pretty big problems that go way beyond testing. 
professional software development That's is fair. Fair. about creating things for people with software. I actually agree with it's that. It's not about checking off JIRA tickets or hitting velocity targets or whatever. Those are just steps, mechanisms that are meant to help and don't always. I would argue JIRA is almost exclusively in that negative. Besides for the fact of just keeping track of what needs to be done, the rest of it was a mistake. It seems to me that anyone saying this has lost sight of what it is that we are really doing for a living. This is rather like the airline pilot saying, I know we're overdue, but my shift is over now. So let's just land here and take our chances, even if we aren't at the destination yet. Let's just ignore the bad weather and the mountains. OK, so not all software kills people if it goes wrong, but it's still the same kind of thinking. Our job is to make software that does something useful. No, no, one is, is pure psychosis. OK, it's just pure psychosis. All right, you can't. You can't say those are even remotely the same. Useful. The job of tests is to help us to see that our software is doing something useful. These are not arbitrary process steps or barriers raised by management. This is an essential part of our job as professionals to know that our code works, is safe and is useful. If we can't do that, what is it that we're doing? It's not someone else's job. Regular programming is what we're doing. You know what? That's the thing is that... The... Okay, no, I'm, I'm reserving the judgment. I'm reserving the judgment to the end. Okay. Reserving the judgment to the end. To do that for us. This is always part of the responsibility of any software developer or development. If your organization is structured differently to that, then your organization's wrong, but it's still your job. So now the only question is, what form should this verification of the correctness, safety and utility of our code take? But even before we get to that, let's think about the role of testing in the abstract. What is a test of any kind really for? I think that the common misconception is that tests prove correctness. This is clear. Really wrong. If I'm a doctor and I score 100% in my final exam, does that mean that I can't the very next day make a mistake that kills somebody, or maybe even a mistake based on my own ignorance of something that wasn't tested? Of course not. Mistakes can always happen. We can never test everything. More tests of the doctor may increase our confidence in them that this person... Didn't just earlier he said, no, you could test everything? I thought they're just like, yo, embedded or games or this or that are really, really hard. And he's just like, nope, false, easy. You can definitely do it. But then he just said, no, you can't actually test everything. And he's less likely to make fatal mistakes than, say, a random computer programmer doing brain surgery. But testing is always only a process of sampling. More tests, more samples offer a statistically better chance of success. But only that, never ever proof. Tests are Fair. best used Fair. as falsification. If you score 20%, then you don't get to be a doctor. However many tests you have, you can't prove success. But if you have a single test failure, you know that there's a problem and your code isn't good enough. Unlike doctors, code's more predictable and tests are more predictable of those kinds. So we can use these failures more accurately. No 80% pass rate here. If one test fails, oh, then the safest again. course of action is disqualification. Don't release them. I literally can't hear people when the same animation plays twice. Like at this current point, I cannot hear a single word he's saying because I see the same animation twice. And I don't know if I'm the only person like that, but my brain starts predicting it and being like, question mark in three, two, one, question mark. Change. Dang it, I thought the question mark was there. Anything else is- Oh! There's the question mark, see? I knew it was coming at any moment. My beautiful mom's calling me. We can't take a phone call from Mama, Mama Jen. Us crossing our fingers for luck and simply guessing. Look at, look at that. See, I can just feel it. I can feel it coming. Now the next one though is gonna contain the error. Are you ready? A test failure is a definitive statement that our code is not working. That's one off. That's one. If you release now, oh. what you are saying is, I don't care that my code's broken. You may guess that this particular failure doesn't matter very much. You may even be right in your guess, but it's still just a guess. You don't know. Tests are directly useful when they're failing. They're only directly useful when they're failing. So discarding the results when they fail is dismissing them when they are doing the job that they were designed to do. So now the only question is how best to test. And automated tests okay. are more repeatable, more reliable and faster. Test stream development builds the creation of tests like these into the development process. So you get them as a side effect of how you organize your work. 
okay. to achieve other useful things, notably the feedback on design that we talked about earlier. So this is a much more effective way to create this. Does that mean Haskell's untestable? You can only write a white paper, right? Is that how you test Haskell? Is you write a white paper? Is that what you do? I, I don't know how it works. These tests with less work than trying to add something else later on. And you get better design code no as a tests. side effect. There are more objections than these, but these are all common enough that you will probably face them at some point when trying to introduce test driven development to your team or your organization. I hope that some of my answers may help you uh, to I'm at least my argue your case. One second. Thank you very much for watching. Hey, and if you enjoy you our stuff here and continue to the channel, that. please consider supporting our work by joining our Patreon community. There's links yeah. to that in the description below too. Very, Thank very you. nice. Oh, that was loud. Okay, so my opinion on this one, it's actually quite simple, which is that the more unit tests you have, I do think that it's fundamentally harder to refactor. I know there's a lot of talk about this, but the problem is, is there's an assumption in most unit tests, which is that the interface at which you're unit testing will remain the same. In some sense, you're doing more of an integration test at that point if your interface can vastly change underneath the hood and nothing about it is actually changing. You're more on the integration side than you are on the simple unit testing side, which I think is the most interesting part. So are you doing peer unit testing? Are you going too granular or not granular enough? And so I always find that the larger you can make a test, the better it is. And so for refactoring, uh, whereas on the other hand, as far as implementation goes, when there is a particularly hard thing, something that you cannot get correct on your first try, something that is very, very difficult. Let's just say you have a large megabyte array and you have to manipulate memory throughout this array. You want something that kind of really gives you the confidence that you're manipulating, doing the bit shifting and all that correctly within this large memory region, right? That seems reasonable. To me, that's a great place to get all the way down to the function level, such that when you refactor, you have to rethink about your test because you are rechanging how you're manipulating this memory. And so to me, that's like a sign that your test must be deleted and you must rethink it. Whereas anything beyond that, I always go to the other side, which is you pretty much need to test something in the larger in the larger sense in the more complete picture i have very little i don't have almost any middle ground testing i never like to test large interfaces that do a bunch of stuff because often once you do that you have to start mocking in unit tests you have to start providing these providers you have to start overriding globals you have to start overriding more and more of your program running to the point where are you even running your program or are you just running your mocks are you testing your mocks or your program at that point and that's where my big problem starts happening and so it's like, if I get to that point, I always find like, that's the worst spot to be in. Either I want to like, just simply mock one part, the data fetching, and all data that's coming back has already been pre-played data that I already know. And then everything else is just doing the entire pipeline of the program. And then I just, you know, ensure that like I write out to a file and that's for like my, you know, for my CLI tools, I write out the actions to a file saying, this is what I do. And I, I, ex I expect that to happen or else it's unit tests for something really, really small. I just rare, rarely write medium sized tests, right? Integration level tests is usually what I hear people call them and, uh, or functional tests. Some people call them functional. And it just seems, it just seems crazy to try to say that test driven development, when do you start applying it? To what level do you start doing it at? Uh, because the smaller you make it, the harder it is to refactor, the more you have to disprove, like you have to remove your tests completely and redo them. Because you just, by the very nature, you have to. You just, you have to. And so the larger the test, the easier the refactor. That means I have more freedom to play within the interface itself. Uh, uh, you know, just personal big fan of that. That's kind of where I always do everything at is that I tend to just put it to a certain level and that's as max as I'll ever test. I don't know. I just really, uh, Dave Farley's 100%. Yeah, see, I, I, I'm not, like, I think pair programming is a great, is a great, Thing to use to like learn something i'm all in on pair programming perfectly fine with that but i really don't want to program with somebody that long right it's meant to show you how to get started for me not like a thing you do all the time uh i'm just not into it i just don't think tdd is useful that's just that I think that if you're doing TDD at all points, um, I think that you're wasting a lot of time. I think that it's better, like, especially if you're doing CLI tools or however you do your tools, right? Or however, whatever you build, right? Uh, I build, uh, I build CLI tools. 
So the, the things that I really focus on right away in a project is, how am I doing my standard in? How am I making this more Unix philosophy? And how am I going to do integration level testing? For me, that is the most important thing possible. How about test-driven debugging? Exactly. I do like test-driven debugging. I think that that's good. Like if there's a bug that's particularly hard, I think, I think that that's pretty good. I think that that is, uh, I think that that is a perfect way to go through it. I, I'm just fine with that. And if you want to keep that test, you can go for it and keep it if you feel like it's going to get refactored out right away. Sometimes I find that when I do that, I both delete the test and the code and refactor it into something slightly different, right? I find that it can be, a, you know, it's a little different. And someone asked, where can you go? If you want to submit anything for me to react to, go to the Reddit r slash the primogen react. And I go through that. 100% test coverage. 100% test coverage is both a pipe dream and a wet uh, and a wet dream of uh, whiteboard masturbation. It's not real. It's never been real. Always super, super, super simple to show you this, which is, let's go like this. Uh, you know, uh, R, you have an array. That's a number. And you have an index. You know, like, how about this one? Up to and a number, right? And I go like this. Uh, let out equals zero. Uh, for let I equals zero. I has to be less than uh, up to uh out plus equals a i return out uh r there you go i just i i literally look at this 100 percent test coverage right 100 percent uh 100 percent test coverage and everything is good nothing about this is a mistake 100 percent. there is no bugs in this code yes there is there's very much so bugs in this code, right? Like this is very, very simple. And this is the problem with doing this type of stuff is that it's 100% it, doesn't mean anything. And if you're looking at this and you're like, well, I'd never write code like this. You're right. You wouldn't write code like this. But the reality is, is you write code some other way in which goes through and has the same problems, but you're just trying to like, just trying to pedantically define that 100% is good, despite the fact that I could just easily destroy it. The fact that I could come up with that in virtually no, in, in almost in 